So, uh, hi everybody, thank you for being with us. And uh, today we are uh, welcoming Professor Ashin Data from uh, Cornell University, which is a university uh, in the state of New York in the US. So Professor Data is a member of the Department of Biological and Envi Environmental Engineering, and is uh, in particular an expert in the physics of uh, processes of food products. So thank you regards uh, food as a multi-phase, multi-component and multi-scale porous material, which is of course of interest to us. Uh, and, and we, I am actually looking forward to hearing more about it. So Professor Data, uh, if you will, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So the, there's an interesting uh, relationship between uh, me and the pandemic and Norway, and I'll, I'll tell you uh, what happened. So the last trip that I did was in March, and it was to attend a um, student's PhD exam in DTU. But that student, uh, Marthe Blikra, is actually a Norwegian um, uh, student. And, and so uh, we talked about Norway that time, and that was my last um, seeing of the airport and, and um, haven't been out. So I, I just thought, oh, that what an interesting connection. She's back in Norway and working, and I didn't get to let her know. I, I just um, realized. So I am really happy uh, to, to share um, what we do. What I decided is I am, um, you know, you all know a lot more about porous media than I do. And so rather than do a either an application talk or um, just get into more of the things of what we have been able to do, instead of that, I'm going to spend a lot of time on what we have difficulty with. Uh, j just to share with you, uh, you know, things that we have hard time, um, and and hopefully we can continue some discussion later on and and so on. So uh, let me uh, get started. Okay, can you all see my PowerPoint? Yes, looks, yeah. looks okay. very good. Yeah, so I will go this way. And, um, and, and so, as I said, I'm going to um, talk about some of the things that we have difficulty with. So before that, I, I will, of course, spend some time on what is the theory that that we um, use. Um, so before I do anything, of course, the, the uh, professor doesn't ever do the work. It's the st graduate students and the postdocs do the work. And so it's really a collection of work from a number of people over the years. And the funding sources are mostly uh, the government and uh, some industry funding um, more in the recent time. So I'm going to talk uh, sort of group, I grouped it in three parts. So first I want to show an example because uh, from uh, the little I know are, are looking at website, food isn't what you do every day. So I want to first say, uh, you know, what kind of applications these are and then talk about a little bit of the theory and then get into, like I said, the challenges. Okay, so let me get my uh, cursor going, laser pointer. Okay, so the context is food processing. Why do we do this at all? The goal 
in case of food processing is not so much, uh, not really to understand, at least for my group, very details of the porous structure um, uh, processes and so on, which would be nice to know, but it's more the big picture thing. It's more things that are of direct practical utility that seem to be what uh, drawn us into it. And that seems to be how I can sell anything. Like no project would have ever been sold if I said um, just uh, to the Department of Agriculture, if we say things like, um, you know, we really understand, want to understand the poor scale processes and so on. And, and that could be my limitations on how to sell it, but it'll go harder. Um, so we want to be able to predict, we want to understand and optimize, and I also have a lot of interest in um, educational aspect of things, how we can use these models for education. So prediction is critical for food safety, as you can guess that uh, we, we don't want somebody to get sick or die, we, it would be not, um, you know, and then realize what happened, it would be nice to be able to predict. And then this computer-aided food manufacturing, which would be not um, different from any other manufacturing that reduces experimentation, time to market, and then of course, building intelligent uh, food processing machine. This educational enhancement, which I will not spend any time today, is, is that these simulations can provide multidisciplinary training. So a food scientist who may not know all of these porous media details of the process can still use it uh, to, to get the basic physics out of the process and so on, do what if scenarios without knowing all the details in the simulation. So that's uh, one area we've done more work. So here are some uh, nice colorful pictures of the kinds of things that we did. So drawing, if you are drawing a material, then of course it, um, um, let me see. Huh. Uh, so the pointer, goes away, okay. Okay. Um, so if you're drawing a material, of course it uh, heats, it loses moisture and it shrinks, but the shrinkage eventually stops. And so it's very common process. It's needed everywhere. Um, the thing is, we want to be able to predict the shrinkage, the volume change. We, uh, the, the work before us were mostly measuring the volume change, measuring the dimension change and plug it in the model. That's not what we want to do. We want to stay mechanistic. So that throughout the importance is we want to stay mechanistic. So this is one example where, um, we use porous media. Then here is another one, hamburger cooking. And uh, what we are interested in is um, not just heating and how it shrinks, but um, we want to see whether we're killing the bacteria. We want to see whether we are generating too much of the carcinogens and we like it or not, I certainly enjoy um, grilled meat, but as we heat at higher temperature, we form carcinogens. So these reactions can be predicted once we know the temperature and, um, and moisture. And so here is an example, these heterocyclic amines are the carcinogens, and we can predict from these kinds of model uh, how much we get from single-sided heating versus double-sided heating. Single-sided heating meaning you have to heat really long enough so that all of it is 
done and that produces too much of the carcinogen, double-sided, reduce it uh, drastically, um, but double-sided simultaneously. And then if you're heating with ones, you know, flipping ones. Okay, so it is this kind of um, application that um, I can sell and, and try to get some um, funds uh, without which we, we cannot do any work. So meat cooking is one. And, um, and so, yeah, we can talk about uh, different degrees of donations. Another one we used, uh, this is probably the hardest one that we, uh, we did is puffing of rice. And so think of the rice grain as a porous medium and it heats and you can see the, um, the, the top. Uh, are you able to see my cursor without the, um, the laser pointer? Yes. Okay. See. So it's uh, the tip that heats first and that's where higher pressures are generated but pressure generation itself does not cause the deformation, your, the thing has to melt. So this bulk modulus on the, the last of the uh, videos here, it, it shows that initially it's red, it's very high value, but as it heats, it kind of melts and gets softer and, and then uh, the pressure causes it to puff. And this was quite difficult because of the very rapidity of the process, very high, um, you know, very fast. The whole thing is done in eight seconds or so. Um, so the, this was one of the, and then this was the most multi-physics simulation that we ever did. So this is microwave drying. So uh, this was simulated inside a, a home microwave oven. So we are doing the electromagnetics, the full blown Maxwell's equations that gives the temperature. And what you are looking at is a potato cube. So it's just the cube. I'm not showing you the oven. It's sitting inside a microwave oven. And um, so you get the temperatures from the electromagnetic model from there. I find out how much is the evaporation that gives me the pressure. And, uh, and so, so then first we have the electromagnetics, then we have heat transfer. From heat transfer with evaporation, we have moisture transfer in all two phases. So liquid water transport because of pressure driven flow so you can see where the porous media part is coming from. Uh, liquid water and water vapor also by pressure driven flow. So we have um, mass transfer. And then because it loses moisture, it shrinks. So we also have deformation and the full solid mechanics in it. So this is about the most multi-physics uh, work that, that we have done over the years. Um, but you get an idea now what kind of a, what sort of applications we're talking about and where the porous media is coming from. We primarily have used the porous media at the food scale. So individual potato rather than a stack of potato. I have colleagues in Belgium, for example, they have looked at um, stacks uh, and, and we have not. Um, so now I want to say a little bit about the theory, not because you don't know it, but just to make sure uh, that uh, you see where I am coming from, how the formulations are in our case. Um, so, First of all, you know, when I saw your um, title, your organization title and, um, and uh, the group, I thought, what am I doing here? I don't do anything poor scale. And in fact, the way I know of poor scale is uh, back in mid nineties, I did a, a sabbatic in uh, University of Minnesota Department of Chemical Engineering 
And there was somebody named uh, Scriven. Um, maybe some of you uh, have, have heard of his name. And they were talking a lot of poor scale modeling process. This was in 96. And that's how I even know of uh, poor scale modeling. And I did not follow up on that. Uh, and anybody heard of Scriven or, uh, or Davis Scriven? Um, so I am not doing poor scale. It is this homogenized um, uh, porous media. And, and so what are the things I'm doing? First, I'm doing this mass transfer. So we try to stay mechanistic, of course. So water, for example, I, I will go in more details. It has these different modes. Let me change to the laser pointer. Okay, so it has different modes that I will spend time in. And then vapor also has molecular diffusion, gas, pressure-driven flow, and likewise air. So you take a control volume and you do in minus out plus generation equal to change of storage. And that uh, generates the governing equations. Um, and so we'll have one equation for liquid water, one for water vapor, and one for air. Do I need to go any more um, details at this stage of this? Uh, you can see this, right? This is simply a mass balance of stuff going in and out. Now these fluxes, I, I will go uh, into a little more details in a second. One thing I want you to see, so we have three equations, but four unknowns. We have the concentration of water, vapor, air as unknowns, but how much is evaporating is also another unknown. And that's very important, as we'll see. Um, and then we, we combine them, so for the sake of, um, solution by the way we, we run into problem and you can you can see here for example there's a vapor equation and air equation if there is a lot of vapor generation then you could have at some places air equal to zero and that really is bad news for the um, solution to the the setup equations and so on so we often combine these so water equation, vapor equation, and vapor plus air equation is the gas equation. And then the gas equation rightly can be um, used with Darcy's law. So, okay. Uh, uh, please stop me also anytime that um, if I can explain a little more. So this water transport, the flux due to water, I've left it as flux due to water. And you, if we think of uh, Darcy's law, then the flux would be a gradient of water pressure. And, and now water pressure, we can break it down into a, its components. So it could be gas pressure, it could be capillary pressure, it could be swelling pressure or uh, gravity. So all of these, are included in the framework. Uh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention that I showed you four applications and I'm not after the applications per se. I'm more interested in building the framework so that we don't have to do one model for meat cooking, one model for potato drying. We don't want to do this. We want to build the overall framework and, and be able to change the properties and parameters to uh, go from one food process to another. So it's meant to be built for a, a more general purpose um, use. Okay, uh, and, and the gravity. So all of these are included in the framework. We don't keep all of them for all processes. And then how do we get these? So the gas pressure 
we get by uh, from the amount of evaporation plus any other vapor or let's say if it's a, a bread that has co2 generation carbon dioxide generation so we just add up the vapor pressure carbon that's how we get the gas pressure capillary pressure we try to get this from capillary diffusivity data i'm going to spend time that these data are hardly available and, and that's the most difficult part and swelling pressure we can get from water holding capacity and this has been um, shown using soft matter approach and so on that um, that it's a reasonable prediction from water holding capacity which is easy to measure so we measure water holding capacity and then back out a swelling pressure so we don't keep all of those terms all of the time uh, mm, this is one special case that's used quite a bit and in here when the matrix is unsaturated of course we can drop the gravity and also we drop we drop the swelling pressure and so this is the one i'm sure you you see this all the time and so we use water pressure as gas pressure minus capillary pressure this can do a lot of the problem or anything to do with drying the material is uh, unsaturated to being highly unsaturated so this works just fine and um and so for example um we have modeled microwave heating uh, why microwave heating is special you must have seen or come across things blowing up inside the microwave oven it's because the internal heating can generate uh, evaporation quite rapidly and generate high pressure and and there is always pressure driven flow if the flow doesn't happen then the pressures can get uh, much higher so microwave heating puffing microwave drying frying bread baking all of these we formulated use uh, for the liquid transport using capillarity and gas pressure. As I just said, pressure. The initial case is it is stable. I see me from uh, I'm sorry, Professor Ashim. I think we can't uh, hear you anymore. Or I am the only one. No, oh, he's dropped out for me as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so is it okay now? Yes, now we hear you very well. Yes. Okay, yeah, so I have no idea. One year into pandemic and this never got resolved. I, I, I bought the best router that we I could buy and uh, things work fine, but every so often it just uh, goes this way. Okay, so let me back up for a second. Uh, did you all see this one? Yes, I think you went mute on this one somewhere in the middle. Yeah, okay. And so the other special case is the case of meat cooking, where we can assume that the matrix actually stays saturated. So then capillary pressure is not something we need to include. And also it stays saturated. So there's no gas if, um, in any significant way. So the gas pressure driven flow is also small so we have the swelling pressure so the water the driving force is the uh, swelling pressure and that also was something we we had done um, uh, in the past so so you can see how we're using the framework so those equations that i showed you they are converted uh, when i put in for the flux 
the gradients that we talked about um, and also for concentration of water we put in terms of saturation and porosity. Uh, and so eventually these are solved for saturation of water, mass fraction of uh, vapor, gas pressure, and the evaporation rate. Now it's still three equations with four unknowns. So I have to tell you about how we get the I dot and, and I will do that uh, in, in quite a bit detail. So just uh, hang in there for now. Now the heat transfer, I'll do very simply, heat transfer uh, is basically we use the heat equation, but averaged out over the phases. So the phases are solid, water, vapor, air. And so we think in terms of effective thermal conductivity, which is a, a volume average or a, a thermal conductivity of each individual phases. And um, then the flow part for the heat transfer, flow part is uh, water, vapor, air, um, including the heat carried by each phase separately. And then we have um, evaporation and also and the composite heat source. So if this material is being heated by a microwave oven or in other radio frequency, then we have heat generation term. And the storage term again is weighted average of the heat capacity. So density times specific heat of each one of these components and then uh, volume averaged over um, the, the entire domain uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, of the material. Uh, actually, in case of density and specific, it will be more mass averaged over the, uh, the uh, material. And that's how we set the heat equation. So like I said, the specific heat and density, those are averaged and then convective terms, water, vapor, air, they carry the, the um, heat and then effective thermal conductivity is, um, um, is effective again, weighted average of the different components. So that's how we get the It seems you dropped out again. Okay, now, can you hear me? Uh, poorly, but we can. Oh, poor. Oh, still poorly. No, no, it's okay, I think. Now, yes. now it's okay. And so I was showing this one that foods, you know, when we process, there's always deformation. This is, of course, an extreme one in cupcake baking. And this is one of the projects that we have, and it's giving us the biggest headache. Uh, how do we include this? So you realize that to start with, it's a batter, it's liquid, and then it uh, you know, forms a solid. So how do we do that? Um, so the way we include deformation, this transport equations that I just showed, they and the deformation of the food matrix, they're coupled. And so this is where the Poro mechanics framework comes in. So applied stress is effective stress on the solid skeleton and average fluid pressure. And so from there, we get the 
equilibrium um, e equation for it, so sigma prime being the effective stress on the solid skeleton, fluid pressure we get from the transport equations. I was talking about fluid pressure all this time. And, um, and the, then for the stress, we need to relate to strain and we again um, need the constitutive laws, whether it's elastic, hyperelastic or viscoelastic um, solid. We have used uh, all three of them in different uh, situations, but it's not, it's a major problem to get this kind of data and to characterize the material and worse yet, how it changes with the process. So those are some of the things I, I will talk in a second. Um, so then final equations look like this. We have Darcy's law for each of the phases. Then we have the mass balance and it includes deformation because if, uh, you can see the velocity of water minus velocity of solid. So velocity of solid would come from the solid mechanics deformation. And then finally the energy balance. So this is the set of equations that we do plus the equations for solid mechanics. And it is just the coupling is, is horrendous. Uh, you know, they all affect each other. And this is the worst one. And um, you can see it in case of microwave drying. So you have electromagnetics, power absorption. Let me uh, get back to the laser point. Uh, so power absorption that heats up the material and that causes uh, water transport. And then as water transport, as water is lost, then the material shrinks. So we have solid mechanics, but also as it shrinks, the dimension changes that affects the transport. And as it shrinks, the composition changes and the dimensions changes that affects also the electromagnetics. So electromagnetics, heat transfer, mass transfer, solid mechanics, they are coupled uh, in, it's, two-way coupling, basically, although we try to ignore some of it, but it's a two-way coupling and it causes a, a major problem. And so this is not something I was go I'm going to discuss today, but the main thing is the, the biggest problem we have is computationally, it gets really complex and it's very challenging Yes, we have uh, faster computers uh, at the personal level, but the, the cake baking, for example, is routinely taking 12 hours on a uh, computer that has 40 cores. And so the, but more important than that is the convergence issues. The numerical convergence issues are the major problems. With, uh, with using this equation. Okay, so we have used this framework for a number of processes. Uh, and so if, then for each one, of course, we use some term and not use some other term. Um, we can also get to quality. For example, uh, this is a French fry and a frying process. When we modeled, we know the moisture uh, variation and if we experimentally measure how Young's modulus varies with moisture content, then we can get a Young's modulus variation throughout the cross section, and that will give us the overall um, uh, the homogenized Young's modulus, and that we can relate it to uh, to measured ones. And the good thing about it is it transfers from one process to another. If I do this for drying, then I don't have to, again, get this information for frying. We can use that information because it's mechanistic, because it's modulus as a function of moisture content. 
I'm able to predict how the Young's modulus varies with frying. So these have benefits in terms of uh, mechanistically predicting some of these uh, complex parameters in food. So the challenges is the last one. And I am afraid I'm going to run out of time because there are lots of challenges. So I'll try to um, uh, talk about a few. So I'll, I will um, address three of these. One is the properties, other is the evaporation, and, and finally deformation. So properties, permeability, it's a mess. It, it, so these are all the permeabilities, all the permeabilities that we know in the literature, okay? And some of it is our measured. In fact, I, I got fed up with it and, and uh, uh, 20 years ago, I just went and uh, measured myself uh, without any graduate student. I, I um, measured because it, you can see the order of magnitude on the left. There's so much variation. Some of this data is measured and we just did a measurement uh, with a group in Canada using uh, NMR and so on, but very little is directly measured. Others are predicted and others, still others are kind of guesstimated that it's probably in this range. And so what happens is in these modeling approaches, then you, you, you um, kind of do your best studying the literature, the other materials, uh, you try to come up with your best guess and then you use it. And then everybody else from that point on refers to our paper or somebody else's paper and just uses that value. But that wasn't um, directly measured to start with. One time I looked at capillary diffusivity information and everybody, every paper published referred back to what we did and we didn't measure it. We uh, guessed from very wet material and their drawing, you know, uh, what would be likely capillary diffusivity of water, but that's what then everybody uh, just uses. So the getting the parameters is a problem. And so not just the parameters, it's not one value. It's how it changes during the process. So I want to share with you this, uh, uh, th this kind of bread. I don't know if you had it, so you might have had tortillas. And um, so th these are the uh, Indian uh, flat bread, but the idea is consistent across all puffing processes that you, ro you roll it. And if you just put this in hot, um, uh, flame, it's not going to puff. You have to do this intermediate process where you're hitting the two sides, where you are basically sealing the two surfaces. And then if you put it on high heat, then it, it puffs because the vapor has hard time leaving. Does that make sense? Um, and so we were trying to study this as a generic understanding of puffing process. So it would be heat transfer, mass transfer. And then near the surface, you have these two important things happening. One is if you are heating from the surface, it's of course losing water. And so it's deforming. So you can see this picture, uh, blue being water. So water is being lost, but simultaneously, this is the important part that as at the high heat, the starch is gelatinizing. So it's swelling. And by swelling, as you can see here, it's, it makes it more impermeable. So now the permeability, what I want you to see is, so the permeability varies tremendously, but also it is the permeability variation that is in some ways essence of this process. So how am I going to get this permeability variation and so on? Those become our biggest challenges. 
So in this one, the student is spending a lot of time understanding this process to see how we can guess uh, some of the permeability. Because if we get into measuring in all of these, then each one, just the measurement process would become half of the PhD uh, thesis and we, we're not going to get to what, um, the, let's say the Department of Agriculture or the industry is interested in. This is one problem. Another one, we're doing cake baking. And, and so this is the cupcake baking that I, I was showing you. And, and there, we, have, we need the permeability of this material when it starts from a batter to a baked cake. How do we do that? So as the temperature increases, the material gelatinizes and we have a drop in permeability. This is all based on our best understanding of what happens in the material. It's not direct measured data. So we try to validate the high value, low value around the temperature that it's supposed to change and then come up with a, um, a formulation like this. Um, then everybody else, if this, if we, or when we publish this, then everybody else would be using this one, but we really didn't measure it directly. And this is a problem. Uh, by the way, how many minutes do I have left or, or am I? Uh, you have about 15 minutes. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so that was one property, the permeability. And then mechanical property also, it goes through huge changes. So you can see initially this rise was, it was all red. So very high modulus, okay? It's a hard and glassy material, high modulus. Then as it starts to heat, it kind of melts and it becomes soft and the, the blue is the much lower value. So it gets to be soft and rubbery and it goes through the transition because inside uh, the material, not every place is at one temperature. So there's spatial variation and there is time variation. So how do we include this? This was another one of our, you know, guest value of how things would change. Guest meaning not totally from, from out of the thin air, but some values are in the literature, uh, in the in the glassy state, some values are in the literature, melt starch, uh, th these values are in the literature. And then we know about the time where um, th these transitions happen. Um, May I ask hi, Erica. A question? Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. May I ask a question? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, when you have this rice puffing, is it a peeled rice or is white rice? Uh, because that will also depend on what type of rice and Absolutely. the process. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And they also process these, um, the, the rice, for example, they, they, they could do some pre-processing. In fact, they do for, for puffing, that changes it. So this is uh, without the husk. This is the, the, the rice by itself, the rice grain by itself. And it, the experiments we did were all with white rice. Mm. So it, it's not brown rice. And so, so there is all this variability that, that you can think of. Um, and, and so measuring um, you know, mechanical property for uh, such a small material for these, all these different types of situations becomes very difficult. So another challenge is this evaporation. So you remember that I showed you happily that the four unknowns and three equations. And uh, I never told you what the fourth equation is. So the fourth equation comes from equilibrium. So you can do this in two ways. One is the vapor pressure inside at a point is equal to 
simply the equilibrium vapor pressure for the wet solid. You can do that, but in implementing this in a um, computational software is a pain because then you have to basically rewrite the, the equations and, and so on. But an equivalent formulation has been used in porous media quite a bit. And that's, that looks like this. It's a source term for evaporation. So it clearly shows this fourth equation that was missing earlier. And what you do is you choose a large enough value of K. If you choose large enough value of K, numerically you're forcing PV to be close to PV equilibrium. But you're doing this differently uh, so it's easy to implement because I dot is just a source term for, um, for the vapor equation. But it will be a sink term for the water equation. But this equation as much as is the best one that we can use, it has issues. And, and this one, this is the only time you'll see a pore and, and, uh, and uh, a, a, any um, a relation to pore. What I want to share with you, I think you'll find it interesting. Where does that equation come from? So that actually comes from conceptually thinking inside the, the material at a, at a pore level. So you have water and, and let's say you have some initial amount of vapor and then more vapor uh, more water starts to vaporize. So at some point it's going to stop. So if rho Vf is my final amount of vapor, is everybody uh, with me here? Rho Vf, kilograms of vapor per meter cube. That's my final volume when the equilibrium has happened. And rho Vi is my initial. So the time that it takes to equilibrate inside is, is delta T. So uh, evaporation rate conceptually can be seen as this rho Vf minus rho Vi over delta T. Does that make sense? Initial amount of vapor until the, the pore gets, uh, gets into equilibrium. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the vapor. And so then I can convert the density into partial pressures. And then you get an equation I dot equal to this difference divided by delta T. And that's the format that we were using. So in this case, this K basically includes this delta T, the, the time scale for equilibration at uh, at this uh, pore level. But the most important part is we don't have a clue what this delta T is. What we do is we increase K to be high enough so that uh, these two are forced to be in equilibrium. Now, it's not always true that they can be in equilibrium. If there is very rapid heating, they may not go to equilibrium. So th these also uh, cause problem. The one problem I want to share with you uh, is it's so the evaporation, uh, the way I wrote this equation, uh, the PV equilibrium is PV saturation for pure water multiplied by water activity. Water activity basically brings in the solid aspect of the uh, vapor pressure. Okay, so in this equation, the evaporation rate is a function of many quantities, all of these quantities. But included in there is this gas saturation and the porosity. So what we are saying is, oh, what happened? Um, yeah, uh, let, let me just explain here. So, to evaporate, basically, there needs to be space. So that's what is picked up by Sg times phi. So the gas saturation time. If 
if this is all filled with water, which can, which can happen? Because if you're heating with microwave and lots of water from inside is coming to the surface, but it cannot evaporate as fast from the surface. So the surface can get saturated. So if it gets saturated, then SG is zero. Right? And so then I dot would be zero. And so we are getting these situations where certain domains, uh, the evaporation stops. And it's not clear to us whether that is a, a good physical result or um, that's just an artifact of how we are uh, doing the evaporation rate formulation. So that's, uh, so basically I'm sharing with you uh, this, oh, this is the one I was saying. So interesting part is, remember we are including deformation, right? So, so we could have this kind of a situation where you deform, the pore deforms because you lost water, but because it deform deforms, the saturation of gas decreases. And therefore the evaporation decreases. So lower gas saturation leads to lower evaporation. It, this is the kind of result that I, I was just talking about that we are still struggling with is whether um, we can completely interpret it to our satisfaction. So the last two slides I wanna show is deformation. So here we're trying to do a process where uh, let's say this is mashed potato, okay? And, and it's a disc, and then I want to heat it um, to, to make like a chip out of it, okay? And, and so, so then I want you to see that deformation can happen two ways. One is if you heat internally, then there's pressure development that would cause some puffing but also it's losing moisture. So that should shrink the material. And so the final shape of this is very much, you know, an interplay between this, how much shrinkage is happening and how much pressure is being generated and also at what time. So on the right is you see this volume starting from one, uh, you, if you, in, Think of the effect of expansion, pressure-driven flow, that causes it to increase, whereas the shrinkage causes it to continuously decrease. So, and it's, it becomes very interesting because it, you know, if you keep heating it, it keeps losing um, water and it will keep shrinking. So if you wanted it to puff, it's now too late because even if I increase the expansion effect from the pressure, it's not gonna make up for how much it shrunk because it lost water. So these can give really good insight into how we can manipulate the process to get a certain shape and so on. And the last thing I want uh, to show is, um, is that, um, so this is cake baking again. And so uh, the, the difficulty is you can see in experiment, we measured the cake height. Can you all see that? The um, experimental cake height. So that's how, you know, that's how what we expect and so on. The model for now is giving something like this. So the important uh, thing I want to share is it is being so complex, the difficulty is, is it because how we assumed how the permeability varies? Is it because how we assume the mechanical property varies? It turns out for now uh, that this answer may not be either one of those. The cake uh, has some, uh, chemicals in there that produces CO2, carbon dioxide generation. And that carbon dioxide, gener 
this is another uh, example of input data that makes it very difficult. We don't know exactly what range of temperature the CO2 is generated. And so it seems we can improve the model if we make the CO2 generation longer over higher temperature range, which is exactly what the manufacturers are talking about, uh, but they're not giving us the full details. So, so then this, when we try to match with experiment for a real process, there's lots of difficulty. But to end, I want to say the bright side that without doing this kind of modeling, uh, and this one shows the temperature and the bottom one shows the rate of evaporation. So, so if I um, start from here, um, if I can stop, yeah. So this gives me the rate of evaporation inside the cake as a function of position and time. And just, uh, just by showing that picture, I can make the point that this kind of framework building mechanistically looking at these processes is worth it because there is no other way you can possibly get this kind of detailed information uh, and understanding of the process. So if you really want to build the science, if you want to improve, then uh, the porous media framework seems to give the, the, um, the, the handles, the, uh, the ways to see the details. How is the temperature? Where is the evaporation? Where is the pressure development? Where is it losing more? Where is it getting more crusty? All those can be obtained from this porous media framework or the photo mechanics framework. And uh, that's all. Okay, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, we have time for uh, some quick questions. Okay. If anybody has that. Yeah, I teach in um, in an hour, um, mm. but um, uh, you know I, I would love to chat as much. Uh, hi, hi, Erica. Yeah. Hi, I have one more question. I mean, when you do these things, you know, can you do experiments where you monitor? The outside pressure like in a pressure cooker and by measuring all your parameters at different pressures can't you deduce them back on on some of the ideas of that you mentioned that uh, you know understanding how the pressure is building up or how gas is forming during the baking process so yes yes we we uh, but so that you do sort of uh, increase the outside pressure until the moment where your cake is no longer rising. So can you then? Yeah, yeah. So so there's two challenge. Yes. So so um, first of all, that is the right way to to build uh, things here. There's two problems. One is the type of experiment that you just mentioned. That could be more than half of a dissertation because to, to, to really uh, set it up. And, and the company uh, pay, uh, paying for it, the organization, if it's Department of Agriculture paying for it, they're interested only in the, the final results and you know the, the trends, okay? So if, they're not interested in the exact pressure validation and, and so on. And so that's one. And so those are the two major factors that holding us into getting into very detailed experimental setup. I am not an experimentalist, but I would love to do those experiments. We have done experiments. So it's not me that's stopping it. It's the, the way the flow goes that the, the PhD has barely enough time to do the models reasonably well. 
Mm. Uh, uh, mm. And so the puffing, for example, we did do some experiment, but then we had planned to do more high speed uh, measurement of puffing that did not work out because you really need high heat. And then the cameras, the high speed cameras, they, they cannot take uh, the, the heat. And, and so, so. Oh, okay. But this is, I mean, I'm an experimentalist, but I think that is an, an easy thing to overcome. But I can tell you offline. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, no, I, I will make, make a note. Yeah. Because we actually have the high speed cameras in our department uh, now. And um, yeah, if there is a way we could do uh, do this, that, that would be great. Yeah. Sure.